So in cities, when currency goes AWOL, right, when it hyperinflates or there's significant problems with currencies, people die. And, and they don't just die like a little bit, they die a whole lot. Because the food source stops going into the, into the city, right? The farmer sends money, sends food to get money. If the money is worthless or is hyperinflating or there's huge uncertainty, then food does not flow into the cities and people start to get hungry. And if you can't pay the sanitation workers, then the water gets shut down, the sewage gets shut down. There's this horrible situation that occurs in cities when money goes really haywire. And so whenever you talk about messing with money for people, and, and a lot of people hear Bitcoin as messing with money, then what happens is they view this terrifying scenario because they know how fragile the entire monetary ecosystem is that keeps them literally alive. Electricity, like we had a power outage in Canada uh, in December with a big ice storm and it, we, we had no power for eight days. It was like minus 20. And uh, you really, you get a very strong sense of how hyper-specialized we've become as a species, you know? I mean, I was trying to remember, I was a Boy Scout. How do I make a fire with ice? I think I saw that in a movie. I mean, you really remember just how fragile. And so when Bitcoin comes along and says, this could replace currency, I think people deep down in their monkey brains are like, oh, really? <laughs> but I need that to buy food, and, and they don't really understand it. And historically, this has happened over and over again. It's been a long time since it happened in the West, but uh, you know, Khmer Rouge took over in Cambodia, uh, eliminated uh, some aspects of the monetary system, and people just, you know, then they forced people out of the cities, and people died by the millions. In the Russian Revolution in 1917, uh, money was abolished in many ways, and people starve very quickly. So I, I'm not saying don't evangelize, but recognize it's more than, you know, paper versus bits. For a lot of people, they internalize the dialogue around money as life versus death. And because we, you know, we get the benefit of specialization, but we have the vulnerability of specialization as well, which is if the infrastructure that keeps us alive is threatened, and the infrastructure is money. Right? The older I get, and it's weird to be old enough to say, the older I get, but the older I get, the more I realize, you know, The Matrix, the movie The Matrix, everyone's seen it, right? The Matrix is money. The Matrix is money. Money is what keeps... The rich, rich. Money is often what keeps the poor, poor. Money is what drives the political process. Lobbying, donating in return for favors from the state. And money is what drives war. Because patriotism and war fever is subsidized by debt. Right in 2003 when everybody was gung-ho to invade Iraq, they were gung-ho because they weren't going to see the bill. The bill was diluted, the bill was deferred, right? So uh, people's war fever and pay, people can afford a lot of immoral indulgences in their emotional life because the government controls the money. And I know that sounds like a, a long distance to travel, but I think it's really true. People can afford to say, well, I care about the poor, therefore welfare. I care about the old, therefore social security, because they don't see the bill. Anyone know how much the war on drugs costs a year? Uh, yeah, 20, 40 billion, it's hard to quantify because there's so many opportunity costs that people thrown in jail. So you can be all morally righteous about the war on drugs because the cost of the war on drugs is borne by others and the future. But if you say, I'd love for people to say, I'm for the war on drugs, great, you get a bill. <laughs> 